get my book in silence, so I didn't come back to it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just love the Yatta Alleluia. I love it so much. I uh, just want to say, um, first and foremost, it's an honor and a blessing to be with you here today, celebrate this Mass with you and for you, and uh, to be able to host this at um, this Pasco Center. And I'm so grateful to Eric and Randy Rouse and uh, the Leichman family for um, coming here to Boston and partnering with us and to host this here at the Pasco Center. And it's just an honor and privilege to be with you um, and your love for young people that brings you here. Um, and brings me here. I pray every day, because I love young people so much, I, I pray every day that God will raise up men and women who will not be afraid to mentor young people in the faith. I pray that every day, at least twice a day, when I pray morning prayer and evening prayer, I'm usually to St. Joseph. I pray that every day. And I'm so privileged and blessed to know that I've been praying for you, at least indirectly, not necessarily knowing all of you personally, um, because it's so needed in our world today. It's so needed. Our teens need you. They need your presence. They need your faith. They need your love. You need to incarnate for them. Christ's love being incarnate for you for them. So I just want to start by just saying how, what a joy and privilege and blessing this is for me to be with all of you. And I thank you for your yes and to just rolling up your sleeves and getting out into the messiness of, world, of youth ministry for our teens. There's a story about a college campus minister, a priest, who was approached by a, a student, and the student asked him, Father, he was talking about, about the reality of Jesus' death, and he said, Father, why did Jesus die at the time that he did, you know, 33 AD or so, as he estimated. And, you know, Father stepped back, and he was a pretty smart priest, very, very well-educated, and so he starts to give the answers. Well, you know, and he starts with, you know, Genesis and how God formed the people and in the fullness of time, and, and gave this really astute, you know, historical, theological answer. And the student's listening, and he's listening, and he's like, okay, there's got to be something more. He's like, what? I, I, that's not good enough? He's like, Okay, thanks, Father. A couple weeks later, he comes up to him. He says, Father, I got another question for you. Why did Jesus have to die by crucifixion? So he starts going to the historical, well, the Romans, and, you know, that time Rome, and, like, in public, ex, uh, public um, capital punishment, and they were making a, a statement about who Jesus is and about, about they don't want people to follow in his way, and that's the way criminals were, were persecuted and killed, and blah, 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 going on. And he's listening. Couple weeks later, he comes up to him a third time. He said, Father, why Jerusalem? Why that day, crucifixion, Jerusalem? Why? And so he says, Well, the place, Jerusalem, he starts going through the Old Testament again to give him this astute answer. And he says, Father, there's got to be something more. He's like, What are you talking about? This moment he teaches is the history, this is the, the rich tradition. He says, But Father, I said, well, what do you think? Why? He said, well, Father, do you ever think that maybe Jesus died on that day in that year in that place by crucifixion because he came to save the good few? Whoa. <laughs> I think the priest had to go back to school. I think. <laughs> you know? But... But you know, what a beautiful answer. And I would say that, that that student knew the heart of our God who would leave the 99 and go after the one lost sheep. I would say that that student knew the heart of God, that God is a lover, that God is a lover in love with his people. It makes me think of the letter to the Ephesians this morning where St. Paul says he prays that the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation resulting in knowledge of him. As St. Paul says, you know, we, you know, we proclaim to you that which we know. Faith comes by hearing. St. John is the one who says, we, we hand on to you that which we have seen and heard and touched. You know, we can't give what we don't have. We know that. We understand that. And but like we pray for that reality to come to know. Jesus' love and his mercy and the reality of that sacred heart that he revealed to St. Margaret Mary. And the, 
great joy in the blessing of being in Christ. Last week I was on retreat, and uh, I, was, I did an eight-day silent retreat. It was wonderful. It's funny, I told two lawyers who work here that I was on an eight-day silent retreat. They're like, yeah, lawyers could never do that for a week. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you kidding me? Oh, I love the silence. You know, it's being, you all know, it's like we're, we talk so much. It's like, man, it's just nice to pull away and not talk to anyone for a week. You know, it's so good, you know? And then God just enters in it. And in one point in the retreat, I just, God just graced me with this tremendous consolation. I was overflowing with the love of God. Like, it was just overflowing in me, you know? And I'm like, oh, this is, this is just amazing. Thank you, Jesus, you know? And then this thought came to me, like, I, was, I went for a walk, and this thought came to me, how selfish I would be if I never shared this. That our faith, by its very nature, is missionary. It is meant to be given away. And how selfish I am in those opportunities that I've had where I didn't hand it on. And I'm not talking about those who come to us. We've already made that clear. We do a pretty good job, as best we can, with those who come to us. But what about the ones who aren't coming to us? Or what about the ones that we meet every day? And I'm not just talking about teenagers, either. And I was thinking about this, and I'm saying, how selfish I am. I have, like, it's like... This me and Jesus thing, and, and it's wonderful. And I'm saying, oh my gosh, if I don't share something like this with someone, how selfish I am. This was my reflection. How selfish I am to hold on to the faith just to myself and not give someone the opportunity to consider to receive the joy that I experience in this moment. And it's okay if they reject you and they say no. It's not about me, but how selfish I am to not share the joy that fills my life every day, that makes me get up every day in the morning to be a priest. Interesting enough, one of the graces I prayed for that week, it was, it was an Ignatian retreat, so you, you get all these special graces that you that you're asked to pray for, and one of the days, the grace was this, to allow Christ to act freely in me. Well, that's a hard one. That means I get to give him permission. I get to give him a blank check. If I'm going to take this giving him permission to act freely in me, that means that's a blank check. If Christ is going to be free in me, that means I have to surrender my will. That's a hard one. But I'll tell you something. I've had times where I've said yes in that way and God's worked miracles, and I've had times where I've said no and I probably missed graces, and then sometimes I said no and God did it anyways in spite of me. <laughs> like this past Tuesday night or Wednesday night, I went and visited my uncle who was at South Shore Hospital. And I visited him for a while, and, and as I was leaving, he was in the MICU, and, you know, it's a pretty tough situation there. People are all different types of, of very serious um, sufferings. And I felt this prompting that I should find out if they wanted to see a priest, if anyone wanted to see a priest. And I was like, oh, God, I don't want to do that right now. I'm kind of tired. I've got to be here for this conference. And, you know, like, I just feel awkward, like, saying, you know, I just, I thought it was my security. I felt, oh, you know, I'm like, so I'm like, Maybe I'm not really hearing that prompting right now. And, and I just walk in. You know that when you're hearing the prompting and you're not listening. And I, and I open the door and I leave. And so I, I, gave it, I gave God a qualifier. I said, all right, Lord. You know, if there's someone that wants to see a priest, just have them come run after me. <laughs> just press me, Father. So literally, I turn the corner as I'm going to press the elevator button. And I hear, Father, Father. brother is dying. He just fell ill with pneumonia yesterday. They don't think he's going to make the night. Are you, do you work here? And I said, no. He said, okay, then I won't walk. I'm like, no, no, but I'm supposed to come see you. <laughs> <laughs> and very sad situation, but grace-filled. And I have no problem. I take liberty sometimes, I guess. I had no problem telling that family. I said, I want you to know something. Like, God wanted me to be here right now to let you know you are loved. That your brother is loved by God, by Jesus. He is so loved by God right now. I said, because I wasn't planning on coming here. And you came. But that's how God works. Like, I love it. So like sometimes even in my stubbornness, but you give him a little bit of permission, a little bit of permission, and he takes, he does it. He does it, you know? So then I said, okay, now I need to go to the nurses and ask them if anyone wants to see what he said. I'm not going to let that happen twice. 